بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوه وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المسير Thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all his blessings and in particular the blessings that we have received in uh, learning in the Hosea and asking for his guidance and assistance, we start this course. The title is Practical Wisdom in the Quran. To understand what we want to achieve, I explain quickly uh, the way that Muslim scholars have classified disciplines, sciences. So one way of classifying sciences has been to say that they are either related to theoretical wisdom or practical wisdom. al hikmatul nazariya or al hikmatul amaliya al hikmatul nazariya is about those things that are there or are not there, is or is not. It's a matter of understanding facts. al hikmatul amaliya is about what is to be done or not to be done. Salam to out or up not. Uh, so Al Hikmatun Nadariya was normally divided into three. One was Ilahiyat theology, including of course Ilahiyat Bil Ma'nal Aam and Ilahiyat Bil Ma'nal Achas. Bilma'an al in the broader sense is philosophy uh, or what they call falsafiyya uh, ula. It's about general characteristics of being. Ilahiyat bilma'an al in the narrow sense is about wajibul wujud. For example, in Bidayatul Hikmah, the first 11 sections is Ilahiyat bil Ma'na al Am. The 12th section is Ilahiyat bil Ma'na al Akhas, which is about Wajibul Wujud, which is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ilahiyat in both branches, both parts, is part of Al Hikmatul Nadariya. Then, Riyadiyat, mathematics. Mathematics is also part of Hikmat al Nazari. And you know, it was very popular sub science in Islamic <coughs> seminaries, even up to maybe generation before us. It was very popular now because people studied in universities or you know, schools. <coughs> They don't uh, normally study mathematics in the houses, but in the past, uh, we didn't have universities or schools. Everything was taught in the houses, and the experts were normally experts who are graduates from the houses. And many of our ulama have books on mathematics. Uh, so, riyadiyat or mathematics is another branch. And tabi'iyat. 
Sabi iya means physics. About knowing this world. If you remember, uh, we said uh, in the course on philosophy, the reason uh, metaphysics is called metaphysics is not because it is about beyond the physics, salam as some people think. Uh -huh. It's not ma vara at tabia. Metaphysics is about every type of being because metaphysics ilahiyat bil man al am. Okay? Ilahiyat bil man al am talks about being as such. So it includes physical, material beings, it includes also immaterial beings. So metaphysics is not only about something which is beyond physics. It is ma ba'da tabia, not ma wara tabia. Ma wara tabia means supernatural. Ma ba'da tabia because when students of Aristotle wanted to classify the works written by him or his notes or whatever, then they gave everything a name and they knew where to put them. But then when it came to issues related to being as such, they didn't have any name. So they just looked, what was the section before that? Was Fusika. It was about Tabia, Tabia. So they said, Ma Ba'da Tabia. What is after <laughs> physics? So this is not what is beyond or above. It is just after in the sense that the order. So Tabi'iyad means physics. In that sense. If you study, for example, Ilahiyat of Shifa, you see also there is a section. Tabi'iyat of Shifa. There is also Riyaziyat of Shifa. Of course, these can also have some introductory sciences, like, for example, you have logic also for philosophy, whatever. But the main three branches are these three. When it comes to al-hikmatul amaliyya, practical wisdom, which is responsible for telling us what to do, what not to do. It's not descriptive, it's normative. Theoretical is descriptive. It says what is there, what is not there. It helps you to discover the realities and distinguish between fact and falsehood. Reality and falsehood. Truth and falsehood. Uh, sorry, al hikmatul amaliyya practical wisdom is about what should we do. And they divide into three major branches. One was akhlaq, ethics, which is about every person, what he is supposed to do or she is supposed to do or not to do, and virtues, vices, and so on and so forth. Another one was Tadbir Manzil. Tadbirul Manzil. Managing house. House management. Like domestic economy. How you run your home. It was very important to run a home. Unfortunately, we underestimate a lady who is running the home. Yeah? But to run a home, looking after the economy of the home, I don't know, every health of the home, nutrition, uh, moral, emotional aspect, everything, it needs big hekma. Yes? Just want to briefly mention, Alex, that there's an Oxfam report out on uh, equality and inequality. And they put a value to these women's work. Yeah. If all the women worldwide, if they put a monetary value to it, it would be $10 billion. More than that. <laughs> they have underestimated. <laughs> so, the second is Tadbirol Manzil, house management. The third is Siyasatul Mudun, politics. How to run cities. You know, in the past, 
cities were called estates. Uh, cities were estates because this concept of country is not very ancient concept. There used to be estates which were cities. Even for example, if you go for example to Italy, in Rome, there is a building which is the embassy of Venice to Rome. <laughs> so Venice, which is a city, <laughs> had the embassy in Rome. Every region used to have its own prince or princes, or you know, they were like different countries. Anyway, Al Hikmatul Amaliyah covers what every person should consider about his or her moral development, house management, and society, which is the form of politics. Uh, you see, these are presented as two branches of Hikmah, because the idea was that Hikmah is the mother, philosophy is the mother of all sciences, and every sciences must be known by a philosopher, by a hakim, by a person who has hikmah. And you see why people like Aristotle, for example, Plato, Socrates, you know, or in Muslim world, for example, people like Abyssina, Farabi, they have books normally on all these issues. Okay? Because they had the idea that you should know everything, you should have a holistic understanding. Nowadays, we have advantage of a specializing. Okay? We specialize in different sciences and sometimes even within a science we specialize in particular field and then subfield. This has some advantage, but this has also disadvantage. Because if you don't have a holistic understanding, then there are lots of interconnections that you miss. Yeah? You cannot solve a problem in this point unless you know other things. For example, in the past, if you went to an alim or hakim and mentioned your problems, you could understand, is it about your body or the soul? <laughs> if it's body, what type of food or medicine you have? If it's about your soul, what type of, for example, you know, uh, zekri you should have or what type of uh, spiritual exercise you should have? He could consider your body and soul together. Now you go to a doctor, even cannot consider your whole body. Yeah? And sometimes they also make make mistake in diagnosing the problem. So, the idea was that philosophy is mother of all sciences and a philosopher should know all these things. But then, little by little, uh, they had to withdraw because these sciences expanded and, you know, universities, faculties, departments, all these things, you know, came so. My main point here is not about disciplines and how to classify disciplines. My main point here is that, is this okay? It gives signals. My main point is that unless you have the practical side, the theoretical side does not uh, that much benefit. So, when we say these are two branches, 
It doesn't mean that you say either I choose this one or that one. You need both. Like for example, you have body and soul. You need both. You cannot say I only look after body and another person says I look after soul. If you want to look after yourself, you have to look after body and soul. Here also, if you want to progress, you have to have both. Hikmat nazari, hikmat Okay? Now, inshallah, I will share with you what is my humble understanding of hikmah from a Quranic perspective. This was the way traditionally, or one way that traditionally hikmah was used in the sense of like philosophy and then branches of sciences. Inshallah, we will talk about it uh, later. In this course, what we want to, inshallah, achieve is to focus more on practical wisdom. We don't want just to understand what exists or what doesn't exist. Inshallah, you learn this in Aqa'id, in philosophy, and other subjects. What we want to understand in this course is what should I do? What should we do as individual? As a community. Uh -huh. Ahkam, very good question. Ahkam looks like practical. But indeed, even Ahkam is theoretical. Yeah? Because Ahkam gives you a set of general rules. It doesn't tell you what you are supposed to do. You need, again, another kind of understanding of your situation, your context, to understand which rules apply to you. And if there is conflict between the rules, if there is tazahum, which one Proceeds. Okay? So, you can learn fiqh, but it doesn't mean you necessarily become wise. You can even be mujtahid, but doesn't guarantee that you are a wise person. So, what we want to distinguish is distinguish between ilm and hikmah. لما بلغ أشده آتيناه حكما وعلم or علما وحكما please someone check Surah Yusuf we gave him knowledge and حك is one interpretation is wisdom these are two separate things علم is something Hikmah is something else. In other words, Elm is a prerequisite for Hikmah. You cannot be ignorant and wise. The one who is Hakim cannot be ignored. But the one who is a Hakim may not be expert. What is important for Hikmah is to benefit from knowledge in order to have an enlightened 
decision. It's a very important point. You have to benefit from knowledge in order you have an enlightened decision. But you can have this knowledge because of your own scholarship or expertise. Or maybe you ask someone who is expert. You, you benefit from knowledge, but maybe you are not expert. For example, a wise leader does not need to be expert in every field that he wants to make decision. But if he is wise, in any field that he is not expert, and even in the field that he is expert, he consults experts, puts their ideas together, benefits from their understanding, but then based on his wisdom, makes the decision. Okay? So, a wise person knows few things. Either he knows the subject about which he wants to make decision, he's expert in that, or he doesn't know the subject, but he knows five things. First, he knows whom to ask. It's not that everyone knows whom to ask. Second, he knows what to ask. Sometimes people ask things that whether they know or not, it doesn't make big difference. Inshallah, I will read for you a hadith from Luqman al-Hakim that relates to this topic. So you should know what to ask, especially in this world. If you remember first session, I said you have to be very selective and focused in this age. You have to manage your questions. Maybe you have billions of questions. But Few of them are very important. The rest, whether you know or not, it doesn't make big difference. It's good to know, but if the cost is not to know more important questions, you have to leave them. You have to manage your question. So, you know that you have to ask. You know whom to ask. You know what to ask. You know how to ask. It's also very important. We have manners for asking questions. Yeah? You should not ask something when it's not the appropriate time. For example, you are in the beginning of your Jose studies. Then you ask about very complicated philosophical or mystical questions. That is not the right time. Even the books that you read, you have to know which books you need to read now and you would be more efficient. For example, when you, still you are new in your studies, you can read history a lot. Why? Because history doesn't need that many uh, skills and disciplines that it would be better if you postpone it to you study philosophy and, you know, usul of fiqh and so on and so forth. Or you can uh, study aqaid. You can uh, study akhlaq. But if you want to uh, study philosophical books, mystical books, kalam, not, it's better to postpone it when you have some skills, when you understand, because, for example, if you have studied in the whole of five years, 
then one hour of your study should be like five hours of a student who is the first year. As an example, I'm saying, no, not definitely five hours. An alim, after 20, 30 years, if reads one hour, he gets the result of someone studying 20, 30 hours. Because your mind is so much trained and you have so many things to analyze the text. You give one ayah, one hadith, one text, one page to an alim. One hour, he understands something. Another person takes 20, 30 hours. If it's a good alim. So, you have to manage your time by seeing when is the most productive, efficient time for studying that subject. When uh, we went to Hosea, I remember one of the issues that some Talabi had difficulty, but it was a positive difficulty, was how to control their interest for reading. Because they had lots of interest in reading, you know, books, general books. Because we have general Islamic books, but we have also books of our study. Books of our study normally are boring. Yeah? You don't want to, especially in the first few years, you don't want to study Arabic or Mantek or, you know, it looks boring. You want to study books by Ayatollah Mutahari, by Ayatollah Tasqeb, you know, by, uh, you know, other great scholars, because it's something more practical, more relevant to your life. But you have to manage your interest. You have to say, right now, I have to learn these books because they give me the skills. They give me the tools. And after having these tools and skills, I can read those books and benefit more. Or, I read them in holidays. A Talabe should have plan also for holidays. Because, unfortunately, we have too many holidays. Yeah? In the whole year, especially here, we have 32 weeks. We have two semesters, which is 32 weeks. 32 weeks maximum is five days. And for us, of course, it's not five days, but even if it was five days, becomes 150, 60 days. So it means 200 days have gone. Plus, lots of occasions, holidays, cancellation, you know. So most of the classes are about 100 sessions, even if they are five days in the Jose. Even if they're five days, no, maybe 100, 110, which is very sad. So, you have to have a plan for your holidays. Summer holidays, alhamdulillah, this year in summer we have summer week, of course. But yourself. Uh, weekend, you need one day at least for family, for other things. But even part of weekend you can study or teach. Uh, and long summer holidays, you know. Anyway, Hakim is the one that knows that he should ask, knows whom to ask, knows what to ask, knows when to ask, and more perhaps uh, important in the sense, because it's the last thing, knows what to do with this knowledge. There are people who ask questions, but they, they don't know what to do with this information. <laughs> You know, sometimes I say this, of course, it's maybe a kind of generalization. I don't want to generalize, but you know what I mean. In some countries, research is very important. A good portion of budget goes for research institutes, research projects. If they want to do anything, they do good research, and then based on that, they make decision. They pass the law and start doing things. Okay. For example, if they want to make a new airport, 
they do lots of research and if everything is positive they make their report if not they don't if they want to make any decision about health policy whatever they do lots of research in some countries research was not something very important they make decisions very easily but now because the world is all connected and people realize that you know how important it is to do research so what they do in some countries some countries really started doing research but some countries they don't do research in the way that they should do research they open research institutes they fund them they fund universities so they spend money on research but in the end the one who is making decision disregards all this research and does what he wants so they are just happy that they have these research institutes but they don't benefit from this different for example political interest or personal interest or pressures coming from you know different even sometimes it's very uh, you know sad sometimes not different research institute give different results you know sometimes different because these research sometimes are not objective depending on their own interest they make sure that they come to that conclusion but sometimes it is more sad because these research institute based on who commissions them they do the research in the way that suits them so this is very sad so what we need is not just to have research and information then we need to make good use of this information hakim is the one who knows how to make good use of this information otherwise either you get a stock you don't know what to do with this information or you just ignore or you would lose your direction because you know this research in the end of the day is just one side of the picture and you should have the whole picture to understand whether we should go by this or we should not go by this keep it on hold or you know give priority to something else so you have to be very careful so in my understanding hakim needs knowledge cannot be jahil but doesn't need to be necessarily alim in every field either he is alim or he makes enlightened decisions by benefiting from elm which is available and he knows how to make good use of them for example if a patient is wise knows to which doctor he should refer you know which type of treatment he should choose <clears throat> he doesn't need to be expert but he knows how to find best treatment for his illness but if you are not wise you can have the same doctors and the same medicines but for example you keep try this one day you leave it half the way you leave try this one leave it half the way you mix them you ignore them you get confused so many things can happen if you are not wise so hikma in my understanding would en- would only exist if you can make practical decisions which are appropriate if you say i only have hikmat an nazari it means that you don't have hikma you are not wise <laughs> you are only wise in the quranic sense if you can make proper decisions 
This is very important requirement for Hikmah. And in the end of the day, no matter how much success you have in other fields, what makes you successful is your decisions. People, nations succeed based on decisions that they make, not based on what they know. So, Hikmah and decision making are very much closely connected to each other. It's like if, you, if there is a football team, yeah, the main thing is the goal. You have to strike a goal, yeah. If you are very experienced, very good player, but you don't know how to have a goal, start a goal, you are not going to succeed. The maximum is just to defend. Our institutions, our communities, our Ummah need people that can make success for us based on proper decisions. We need people who can give us credit by proper decisions. Sometimes one decision can change the destiny of Ummah. And one wrong decision can defeat an Ummah. Decisions are very important. In your life, you make lots of decisions. Some of them are very fundamental. Some of them may look not fundamental, but indeed they may have lots of consequences that you cannot predict. You have to be very careful about your decisions. If you have two people who have studied the same amount, both of them, for example, are very well educated. But then when it comes to decision making, one of them is careless, one of them is Hakim. They make big difference. All that knowledge does not count if you don't make good decision. Okay? It's very important. And actually, I believe also, this is a, another discussion, I believe big empires, big governments, big parties, more for the most part are not destroyed by their enemies they are destroyed by their own wrong decisions we are normally defeated not by wise attacks of the enemy we are mostly defeated by our unwise policies and decisions. Even in the business, when you have competition, your decisions is the thing that make you successful or not. Not the other people's decision. They always try to be successful, but if you are clever and wise, you can succeed. Okay, so Hekmah has to be practical, has to influence the way we make decisions, and then how you implement your decisions. Sometimes we make good decisions, but then we don't implement. Sometimes we don't have good 
for example, regulations. Sometimes we have regulations, but we don't follow and we don't implement. Therefore, it's very important that we make good decisions, wise decisions, and we implement them. Now, let me read for you some hadith to bring you to the atmosphere that we have in Islamic uh, literature about hikmah, and then we go to Quran to focus on the Quran, inshallah. Because I want to speak another 50 minutes, so maybe I give you a break and then shall we continue. So we can have a few minutes break and then shall. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil